Welcome to the chapel of Robinson College here at the University of Cambridge. This is our first service of 2021 and today we're delighted to welcome Reverend Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton has been a civil rights activist for decades. He is the founder of the National Action Network. He's a fellow Baptist minister and in 2004 he was a candidate in the US presidential elections. His new book, Rise Up, is a sophisticated and lively engagement with many of the issues that we face in the modern West. And we begin our interview with a reading that surfaces at various points throughout that book. The reading is taken from a letter to a church in Ephesus, where the recipients are exhorted to take their stand against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, by which Sharpton understands some of the hidden hierarchies and the political ideologies that quietly sink themselves into the psyche of the modern mindset. A conflict is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Reverend Al Sharpton, a very warm welcome to Robinson College Chapel. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be with you. The, today, it's the last day of the Trump presidency, and many in the um, US and elsewhere in the world will be looking on in, in horror at recent events in Washington and looking even at DC today, it looks like the dying convulsions of every other empire in history. But it's quite clear from reading your book that as a general possibility, this is not something that will have shocked you. And I wonder if you can say something about your reaction to recent events. My reaction is that I clearly uh, felt that uh, the Trump presidency would be a calamity. I had nowhere known it would be such a calamity and so obvious to everyone. Uh, but in my dealings with Trump uh, down through the last three decades and where I forward him on issues from the wrongful uh, accusing on his part of five Central Park, uh, five young men were accused of Central Park rape that were false, all the way to his charging that Barack Obama was not really an American citizen and had been born in Kenya. Uh, I knew that this man was ruthless. I knew that this man was narcissistic and he had no real moral boundary. And I had hope, as anyone would, that he would grow into the job. Uh, because sometimes when uh, God gives you mercy and you it can get through anyway to some level. You grow into it. You embrace it. I, you leave my bad characteristics behind. He didn't change at all. And it became obvious after a while that he was not even trying to. So I knew something was going to happen. To the degree that it happened and came to uh, uh, to to to, to, to be, to exist on June, uh, January 6th, uh, was something that uh, was just heartbreaking. Yeah. To see the United States Capitol uh, under siege, the Capitol building under siege, and uh, the vice president having to be brought out for uh, safety, members of the Senate and Congress being threatened by not a foreign force, but by American citizens mm -hmm. incited by the president of the United States who addressed their rally and told them we're going to march. He instructed the march. This was unprecedented. So even I who have a very low opinion of Donald Trump didn't think he would be that low. I read that 5% of African American males in the US today are currently serving time in prison, which is 5% is 
unthinkable to us. So, and I've read elsewhere that more African Americans are working in slave labor conditions in the US prison industrial complex than there were slaves at the height of the plantation era. And there are those who present Biden as a zealot for the prison industrial complex. And, you know, he wanted to name the 1994 bill after himself and so on. And Kamala Harris, she pulls out of the presidential race when Tulsi Gabbard confronts her on her complicity in jailing citizens for trivial offences. When it comes to questions of race, will the new dynamic duo be much better? Well, they couldn't be uh, worse. Uh, I mean, you would, you, you'd have to start there. I've had uh, my uh, disagreements with Joe Biden, they're very public. Uh, 94, I marched on him with the crime bill. Yeah. But at the same time, in fairness to him, most of the Congressional Black Caucus supported the crime bill. And uh, many of those in the civil rights community did. I think it was an overreaction to, uh, there was a big spike in crack epidemic at the time. And uh, I think it was an overkill. But it was wrong. I said then it was wrong and it was racially disproportionate. I've disagreed with some things uh, that prosecutors do. But I think at the, and I'm talking there about uh, uh, Vice President elect Harris, but I think at court, I've got to know Kamala Harris. I think she will fight for what is right. I think that she will stand for criminal justice reform. And I think Joe Biden will. Uh, just like I disagreed with him in 94. I worked with him for eight years when he was Barack Obama's vice president. I had reasonable access uh, to the Obama administration, which put me in a room several times with Joe Biden. And he stood up. He was the one that I was president, that fought uh, for LGBTQ rights. He was the one that was there. In fact, we were seated next to each other when President Obama announced the police uh, uh, reform task force. So I think he grew and I think he's become more sensitive. He's reached out, we met with him, uh, the heads of seven national civil rights organizations, uh, met with him virtually uh, about uh, three weeks ago. Usually a president waits until they're inaugurated to meet with civil rights leaders. He met uh, uh, in advance of his inauguration to send a signal that he's open. So I think that he's uh, going to be open. I think that uh, uh, Vice President-elect Harris will be open. Not to say, though, that we're not going to hold him accountable and that we're not going to be pounding on the door and pressing them. I just think we'll get a better reaction, but we are not at all going to hesitate on the same aggressive activism that we demonstrated under the worst conditions. Mm -hmm. So there are grounds for hope then, significantly in comparison with the previous administration. I think there's grounds for hope, uh, and and that hope. Uh, I think there's there's significant grounds for it. You have a, a Democratic White House now, Democratic U.S. Senate, with the tie vote uh, with the Vice President, and a Democratic House of Representatives. So if all branches of government and, and, and the executive and legislative branch are all Democrat. There's no excuse for them not to get legislation through. And that's how we are going to be functioning, saying we don't want any excuses. And uh, I think that that gives us an opportunity to press and get some things. It's a nice way of saying it, I think, um, not having an excuse, because you, when we talk about the Democrat Party today, um, I can't help think of one of the phrases that you have coined, um, latte liberalism. It's, it's a very widespread condition, I think, in the UK as well as the US, I suspect. And can you expand a little on what you mean by latte liberalism? Latte liberalism are those that sit around and drink lattes and talk great social policy, but don't enact it. Don't put any, what I would say, skin in the game. Uh, they, they're great at ideological and philosophical discussion. They are very bad at execution. And I think that that is why you have to have activist groups like uh, Nash Action Network, which I have, and other groups 
because latte liberals will, you know, they'll they'll tea party you to death. But will they change the laws? And will they enforce the laws? And will they put the necessary pressure on those laws? And that's where uh, I, I think uh, those of us that are real have to come forward and put pressure. Um, I can't help thinking then of, um... It's Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel who said that indifference to evil is worse than evil itself. Uh, it's one of those quotations that liberals like to throw around, but actually what you're talking about is whether or not you get as far as putting into action the principles by which you claim to live. You know, uh, I, I, I wrote about uh, Heschel, I referred to him in my book, because I met him as a, as a very young oh, man. Really? And uh, yeah, I was uh, I was youth director of Operation Breadbasket when I was 13 years old, which was a division of Dr. King's organization. I was appointed uh, the youth director of the New York branch the year he was killed. I was 13, and uh, I became for a while a mentee of Reverend Jesse Jackson, who was the national head, and he brought me to the Jewish Theological Seminary, and I met Hesh, and I was like 13 or 14 years old. In fact, Escher gave me a, a lot of his books, and uh, down through the years, I reread them. What made Heschel significant, when I hear a lot of people quote Heschel, is Heschel went to Alabama and marched with Dr. King. Yes, Heschel yeah. would write uh, members of Congress. So Heschel would then sit in an ivory tower, removed from the struggle. He engaged the struggle, and it was a struggle of Black. So when mm -hmm. Heschel would deal with the uh, uh, atrocity of two Jews and a black Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner killed for going south to help blacks register to vote. He did it as one who actively were involved. You have many today that are quote Heschel from ivory towers, but never come out of the tower and never deal with the racial imbalance in the tower from which they sit with. <laughs> of course, yes. These blind spots, I guess, are, are endemic with the condition that you write about. Um, the, one of the phrases I've read from um, Chris Hedges is the phrase boutique activism. And be, because activism itself has become a trendy thing, we want to be perceived as activists. But, and I think that the danger in activism just being trendy is that you want to appear to be active, you want to appear to be an activist with no strategy and no end goal. So it's the goal is the trend, not the achievement, not the change that you need. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got to be aware of that because if we're going to protest, if we're going to march, and nobody has done more than me, what is the goal? Yeah. And how do we fashion the protests and fashion the march that will lead to that goal? That's why uh, last August, August 2020, uh, Martin Luther King III and I, National Action Network, had the big commitment march uh, on Washington, over 200,000 people. And it was difficult because it was a pandemic. We had to get face masks. Everybody cost a lot of money, took everybody's temperature, but we put 200,000 people around the uh, reflection, uh, the reflection pool that uh, the Lincoln Memorial, where his dad had done 57 years earlier. But we said the goal is the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Bill, uh, which had passed the Congress, sitting dormant in the Senate because Mitch McConnell did not uh, put it on the floor. Well, now that uh, we have a Democratic majority. Chuck Schumer becomes the new majority leader. Chuck Schumer spoke yesterday at National Action Network in uh, Harlem, our headquarters, for King Day, and committed he's putting that bill on the floor. Suppose if in our march in August, when we highlighted that the George Floyd families there and other families of victims, if we had had a riot, or if we had had uh, all kinds of uh, incendiary rhetoric, we would have felt better that we got our rage off our chest and it would have trended, but we would not have been in position for a Schumer to identify with the bill because it would have been beyond what some 
Democrats and some Republicans in the Senate would entertain. So what's the goal? And how you protest must match and accommodate your goal. Otherwise, you're just trending. You're not protesting. That's very interesting. I mean, the uh, I was picked up on that in the last interview I did with, um, this is Amitav Ghosh. The, the fact that his novel makes you want to do something still makes it about you, not about the other, the people Absolutely. who you're concerned and, and about. And that's why, that's why I always challenge people is not what do you want to do, what do we want to achieve? Because the achievement removes the personal ego and the personal uh, agendas out of it. We're yeah. all going to have our egos anyway. We're all going to have our agendas anyway. But let's have the agenda be something achievable and then let your ego be part of, I got this achievement done. I, uh, uh, let your agenda be, we get this achievement done. Why do we remember Dr. King? Why do we remember Mandela? They achieved things. There were people that had a much more militant style, an aggressive style. We don't remember them because they did not achieve things. Mandela led a movement that did bring down apartheid politically in South Africa. Dr. King led a movement that did bring down Jim Crow in America. Those that were more militant or, 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 or perverse than him didn't achieve anything. People at the end of the day only remember what you got done. What did Malcolm X achieve? I think Malcolm X's achievements was different than King. He was able to uh, bring about a realignment uh, of pride and self-identity in our community. Uh, I think uh, Dr. King dealt with the external social and legal impediment. Uh, I think Malcolm's was uh, where he dealt with the internal uh, insecurities and inferiority complexes that had been imposed on. Mm -hmm. So I think we uh, needed both. It's not one or, it's both and. I think that where it is wrong is to compare the two because they were doing two different things. Yeah, Malcolm yeah. was about building the uh, self-concept of a people that had been broken. Dr. King was about breaking down the barriers in society. And you need both because if you didn't have the legal barriers broke down, you could build your self-concept and still be limited by the reality of the social order. If you did take care of, uh, of, uh, of all of the uh, barriers down, that Dr. King did and didn't have a self-concept, you still wouldn't use them even if they were free to you. So you needed both of them. It's great. It's interesting to hear you talk about the multi-dimensional nature of this struggle, because we still measure people on a two-dimensional spectrum and trying to place you on that spectrum between left and right, it's not possible. And I, I wonder if you might say something about your role in the political nexus of what's happening in the US today? Well, I think I come out of the black church. And I come out of the civil rights king-like tradition, which is grounded in the black church. And I believe in uh, nonviolent direct action to achieve legal and economic uh, parity and equality. Now, any given time of the political climate, that could be considered left or right. And I think that that I don't get caught up on where I fit. I get caught up on what I believe. If you've got a uh, an administration in power, be it national or be it in a uh, local situation, I may be to the left of them or the right of them, but I will never be where I'm not in aligned with what I believe and have represented all my life. I think that's what happened to Dr. King. Uh, Dr. King was considered a radical. Then as the Black Power Movement started and people started talking more self-defense, he was considered more centric. And even to some of them would say to the right. But what he was was consistent. And I, I don't believe in this uh, taking the temperature to find out what's fashionable at the time. Oh, I better go here because the left is over there or I must appear progressive. No, you must appear consistent 
And that's based on what you believe. And I, at the end of the day, uh, people that try to fit me somewhere are doing something that I don't try to do for myself. I'm not trying to fit. I'm trying to be effective. One of the things that you say in the book, you talk about coming from the mud. I mean, that's a polite way of saying the, the kind of thing that St. Paul said about the disciples and the early Christians. Uh, and he used a much cruder word. But um, on the one hand, you've got that side of the narrative. You've got the massive meta-political stuff, but you are also going into the mud again. So when there's a moment of crisis or disaster or outrage, you go into the cities, into the situations, into the families in moments of profound pain as a figure from outside. And I, I wonder, can you say something about that experience, about being- I think outside? that uh, down through the years, when there's been a racial killer or a police killer or denying of a business contract, people will call and I'll go. Uh, I've never gone in any of situations, including George Floyd, that I would not ask to cover. But the difference is I'll go. I don't care how prominent I have become. I don't care if I got a TV, radio show, I go. Because people need to be engaged where they are. And you should not speak for people that you don't speak to. And you must just by going affirm that they are of worth, that all of us ought to be rallying around them because you push society by saying they can't be marginalized. So when George Floyd's family called me last summer, standing up for George Floyd is to stand up for getting a police bill that will stop this from happening. George Floyd was a regular poor guy, third ward of uh, uh, Houston, Texas, that was trying to redo his life recreated circumstances in Minneapolis. He was no special mm -hmm. person, but he was the victim of a special institutional sin in law enforcement in this country. And that is they could do whatever they want and get away with. It. And that's why I went. I think our job, particularly those of us that claim to come from a faith-based background, is that you can't preach healing and don't go to the afflicted. You can't talk about that uh, uh, there's a bomb in Gilead and don't go to those that need it. And I think that if we are followers of Christ, Jesus did not send a word to those that were afflicted. He went and healed the afflicted. He met the woman at the well. He healed Bartimaeus' eyes. He fed the hungry. How do we follow Jesus and we have this kind of remote control Christianity where I'll hit the button and you may be able to get it. No, I need to go and embrace you and help you in your point of injury to know that healing is real. Otherwise, I don't believe in myself. Well, that, that brings us to the final question, if I may. The, uh, this is our first chapel service of 2021. Um, I don't know how different 2021 is from 2020, uh, but I wonder what challenge as a Baptist minister you might issue to students here at the University of Cambridge. I think that uh, my challenge to them would be that uh, I could not predict any more than you have uh, just stated what 21 uh, brings or will bring to us. I could not have predicted what 20 would bring. There's no way that January of 20, I would have been able to predict a pandemic or George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and the rest that happened in the state. Hmm. So what you must do is you must firmly and unapologetic affirm what you believe and why you feel that you are on earth to represent those beliefs. What is the purpose of your life? What is the meaning of your existence? I do not believe that God made anyone by mistake. There is a reason all of us are on the planet, young or old. The reason that we're here, there could have been any number of reasons that your mother didn't give birth to you. She did, that was a divine decision. 
what was the purpose God had for us and seek that purpose. And if you have those inflexible thoughts of your purpose in your mind, what will happen in 21 is secondary to what you bring to 21. I don't know what 21 is going to bring to me, but I know what I'm going to bring to 21. I'm going to bring a firm commitment, a firm purpose. So uh, some of my friends said, Reverend Alley, you ready for the new year? My answer was, I hope the new year is ready for me. Reverend Al Sharpton, we salute you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to do this. That was... Oh.